and the uh, enjoyment that we have in seeing each other and kind of encouraging each other through the middle of the week. Uh, we are continuing our study of the Why We Teach booklet. We're down to the last few lessons. Uh, I do want to spend tonight kind of putting a um, bow, I guess you say, on our uh, discussion on our worship and instrumental music um, that we've been talking about for several weeks now. And then uh, I think we have just a couple lessons left. Of course, I don't, we don't have the projectors up and running just yet still, so uh, I don't have a recap for you. I'll try to make sure and make a note of that and uh, can get you the information before next week. I'd given Jerry and Charles a, uh, a schedule as I was going to be in and out all summer and laid that out, so I'll double check that and try to, we can put it in the bulletin maybe even if we have room and let you know what we're going to look at, the order we're going to look at the last couple of lessons. And then here we are again, uh, kind of finishing up one study and be willing to, to take some suggestions. We've had a bunch, so we're not necessarily hurting for one. We've had a lot. Uh, Charles and I kind of keep running lists of those, but uh, if something's been on your mind or you thought of something you'd like to, to mention, then by all means, make mention of that, and we will uh, do our best to try to either cover it next or work it in into our list there. There's a lot of good topics that people have suggested us covering, so uh, we, will, we will try to do that as, as quick as we can. Um, so... Again, we're thankful that you're here. Hope we can have a good time, a good, enjoyable time of Bible study tonight, learning a few things, but also enjoying a good time together in fellowship. My voice is about fully recovered from Sunday, although it'll probably get a little rough again after tonight, but I have a few more days before Sunday. Uh, I told Hannah last night, I think, I said, I was tired of listening to myself by Sunday afternoon, so I know a lot of y'all were, but I appreciate your patience uh, working, working through the uh, post-camp uh, blues there, post-camp uh, voice. Uh, so we've been talking for three weeks now about um, the idea of why we teach uh, that instrumental music is not authorized. And that's key, by the way, to this discussion. It's key to the way it's worded there. Uh, kind of the, part of the thing we're going to talk about tonight is, you know, the way that this topic has been often discussed. It becomes a, a lightning rod. It becomes uh, very, you know, argumentative among some people very quickly. Uh, and so it's kind of hard to have a, a good discussion about things. We began a month or so ago, the college, kind of college young adult age class on Sunday morning. And one of the first things we talked about in that class was, you know, how to disagree with people uh, in, a, in society. And really, of course, it would even spill over to the church in a, in a nice way, in a, in a polite way. How is it that we can try to have discussions about things. And yes, on some things, maybe we have to agree to disagree, or maybe even on some things we can agree, come to an agreement of sorts. But we know that that's not usually the case. And again, I don't mean to just be broad, but in our country with politics and, and you know, religion and all these things that they say you're not supposed to discuss with your family or at Thanksgiving or whatever, you know, with all that, we don't often come to agreement. We usually are fussing and fighting about it without ever having maybe even a productive discussion. Uh, and I appreciate Stephen Lawrence. Uh, Stephen mentioned that first morning that he had heard, and I, I'm forgetting now the, the name and all, but, but a particular man who had studied some of these things and had put out an idea that's kind of become popularized, popularized a little bit among people. Of if you're trying to discuss with someone before you even really get into the discussion, that you can be able to say to them what their position is before you can go any further. Not accept it, not say that it's true, but just be able to restate what they're saying back, back to them. And how often is it that we start having one discussion and we end off in the weeds, as we say, without ever really getting back to what we originally intended to talk about? Uh, and that's, that's not helpful. It's just not helpful. Maybe we don't agree, but it's just not helpful when we start wading over into other things that, that aren't even what we kind of originally started to talk about. And so the same thing is kind of true with this, this type of discussion. Uh, this may be one that you don't have a lot. I understand that. Uh, but it's something, that, as we have stated, that's happened in our area, become uh, prevalent even among churches of Christ uh, in the United States. I mentioned to you that some of the first material that was put out uh, was in 2006 by what was, at least at the time, considered to be the largest uh, church of Christ in the United States, in Texas, that was in Texas, um, or is in Texas, but uh, that's you know where it started. There's been congregations in Alabama that have gone through the same study, and now even in our area. 
So I know Charles said it last week, and I wanted to emphasize it again. I know he mentioned, uh, you know, asking me to even do that, but, but kind of to make mention, you know, the fact that it's not, the whole point of this is not to make it an us versus them thing, or we're right and they're wrong, or, or anything like that, but to try to seek out what God wants us to do, and we really want everyone to do that on all things. I mean, certainly we would all agree that when it comes to murder, God says, you know, do not murder and, and you shouldn't have hate in your heart. You shouldn't take somebody else's life. We agree on that. that that's great. Uh, but there are other things also that God has told us to do or has said don't do that we should agree on because that's what the Word of God says. And that's what we're kind of after through all of this is just being open uh, I think I've said it from the first week, but not trying to bash anybody or, or you know, I, I don't want to be accused of, of calling names or, or just talking about people. We would be willing to sit down and discuss this further with you or with anyone else uh, that wants to talk about it. Again, hopefully in a, in a civil way. Uh, but it's only right that we try to understand, as this whole spiritual sword has been about, why we teach and, and believe and practice certain things. It's easy enough in one sense to just simply say, that, you know, the Bible says so, the Bible tells me so, but uh, as we see, not only in this issue, but in many issues, there's sometimes disagreement about that. And so let's try to study and get down to exactly what we're talking about. Uh, one more thing before we kind of maybe try to get a few things tonight, uh, and that is that, um, you know, I don't, I also have said this, I think, before, but I don't mean to come off, don't want to come off, you know, condescending in any way or demeaning anyone. I know that I've even heard people talk before or lessons where it can come off very um, patronizing, you know, well, you just got to be an idiot if you think that, that, that kind of things, you know, we're not trying to say that at all. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, like, even as we've talked about with these arguments, we made a couple of weeks ago, the last time I was here, but even with some of these arguments, sometimes they make really co good common sense. Uh, and so it's easy then to, to kind of, again, wade off into, well, boy, that's just, you just, you got to have lost your mind. No, a lot of people will, will think that and, and hear that and believe that. And sometimes it just takes better Bible study, even as we talked about on Sunday night, bad Bible study. Maybe it takes better Bible study, deeper Bible study, open conversations, and that's kind of uh, what we're after in, in all of these things here. So, um, again, I, I don't, wasn't able to have slides tonight, but don't want to rehash all the things we've said in regards to the argument, but we've made several uh, arguments of what the Bible says. The, if you remember the first week, we talked a lot about authority, and that is ultimately what this comes down to. What authority do we have to do anything that we do? Almost everything that we do is by somebody's authority. Uh, the United States, the government of the United States has allowed us to do this or to do that or, you know, has permitted us to do that or, or not do this. I mean, just anything, even in a physical, uh, worldly sense, but especially in a spiritual sense. What authority do we have to do the things that we do? We spent the first week talking about that. The second week, we came back and we talked about the paper that was put out. Um, that again, I have a copy of, but you can certainly find um, of the reasons why it is biblically permissible was the statement or the way that it's phrased on there that it's biblically permissible to, to have instruments in, uh, in worship. And we kind of tried to work through those and we touched on a few questions that were, uh, you know, questions that you all had. Uh, I'll, I'll open up the floor again or if, you know, if you've had something you hadn't asked and held till now for some reason, that's fine. I haven't got a lot of anything you know, personally or privately, nobody's kind of approached me. The first week, a couple were asked, and we tried to cover those the second week. Um, but things like Revelation, uh, you know, what about Revelation and what it says there? What about the Old Testament? You know, what about what the New Testament does or does not say? Those were the kind of things that we, we emphasize. And those, again, just for lack of a better term, arguments that are made and, uh, and how, you know, we can handle those with looking at Scripture. The other thing that's a part of that paper uh, that Charles touched on last week, and I want us to spend a little bit of time talking about tonight, not only do they say, and again, this is not just the congregation here in town, but you know, in Texas and other places, that it's biblically permissible, but they also kind of pivot in talking about what is missionally profitable. What's missionally profitable. And um, again, if you've got questions about, you know, kind of the authority or the other things, we can take those. But, but I do kind of want to pivot a little bit and talk about the idea of missionally profitable tonight as well. Because I think that is, um, 
important. That, that's a kind of a, 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 an argument that people can make, but they don't always, I think, think about the ramifications of it. Um, one thing I want to say, Charles had mentioned to me that he had wanted to talk last week about the church history that was mentioned in the spiritual sword. If you had that, have a copy of the spiritual sword and haven't reviewed that yet, hopefully you have over the course of the last month. But, you know, goes through there. I think he touched on a few, a couple of them at least. But, um, you know, you, you review those things. That's not even necessarily church history, but just history in general. But we even go back through the idea that in the first century and thereafter, we don't read anybody who's talking about, you know, instrumental music uh, being used in worship. And that's mentioned in this position paper that we've been kind of taking a look at. Uh, the idea that the church was a cappella only until the twen- tenth, excuse me, until the tenth through twelfth centuries. So, you know, a lot of years went by before instruments kind of got introduced. There are a few things that, that they mention in this position paper I wanted to, to share with you uh, real quick. One is that uh, some people suggest the early church wanted to distinguish itself from the debauched instrumental worship of pagan religions. Well, we certainly want to be different. That's true. We sometimes uh, you know, long for ways or look for ways to be different than everybody else. Uh, and, of course, one of those ways still deals with worship and the balance that we try to strike sometimes between um, worship that is you know, an entertainment zone, concert-like atmosphere, you know, complete with, with fog lights and lights and all these things and, and all this stuff going on versus where we can go. When we go the opposite way, we sometimes get to very monotonous. Uh, some might even use a term like boring, but just very rote worship where we know what's happening, we do it every time, and it becomes uh, without feeling. We don't even feel anything at all. And of course, we're trying to find a balance There should be some emotion in our worship, but the emotion should not rule the worship or control the worship. And so, you know, I can understand sometimes that we pull away from uh, from that kind of, again, concert-like, rock concert, whatever kind of atmosphere. Uh, In fact, I was listening to uh, our brother Don Blackwell uh, preach up in uh, Cookville the other night. He did a question and answers, and I, I was curious and went to kind of listen and see what he had said and what the questions were. And one of those was about this idea of our worship. You know, why is it that we sometimes, you know, go through the exact same motion, the exact same time, and it seems like everybody's just kind of sitting there like robots, not showing any emotion at all. And again, maybe that's a different discussion, kind of have to set that aside. But just the point being, we're trying to find that. So it's true that, that sometimes we pull away from worldly ways of, of doing things, worship that we would believe would not be pleasing to God. It's more pleasing to man. A second thing that's mentioned here says others believe that, like today's persecuted church, the early Christians could not use instruments or even sing, maybe sometimes, for fear of being caught. My only comment and suggestion that would be that's, that's kind of a dangerous slope then that we call a slippery slope to try to stand on. If we're going to start avoiding things because of fear of being caught, I mean, then, you know, what if we shouldn't meet anymore? Does that mean we shouldn't meet anymore? I know that maybe we might meet in a different way. I mean, maybe, no, it's kind of the idea nobody's going to go play in the road, right? It's like, well, I don't, I don't want to cheat death by going and playing in the road, as we say, you know, but I'm also not going to fear death by just simply you know, staying in my closet all day long, all week long, and just avoid any interaction. Well, the same thing is kind of true. I, I wouldn't say if, if the, our country were to shift towards really, really negative against Christians and worship, nobody would say that, it, that we should all show up here, maybe, in a sense, and just ask for somebody to come and, and shoot us all or whatever, but we shouldn't also set aside exactly what God has told us to do each first day of the week simply for fear of what's going on in this world, Charles? Yeah, on that point, do we, do we read anywhere in the New Testament of, of Christians doing that? We read into it sometimes. Go ahead, we'll finish your thought. Yeah. Chapter 8, you know, they face persecution. Yeah. 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 Now, and that's kind of. That's kind of what I'm getting at, too. Charles says that, you know, around Acts 8 there, that it seems like as, as the persecution at the end of Acts 7, Stephen is stoned, 
and it says that they were scattered. So again, this balance of, yes, we might make some changes to what we're doing or the way that we're living. They were scattered, but they still went about everywhere preaching the word. Uh, maybe they, they couldn't all be together, but as they went, they still went about doing those things. And, and Charles makes the point, they were still preaching. So, um, you know, again, that, that just kind of creates this, well, if we're going to avoid that, then, uh, you know, what else might somebody be willing to add? In connection with that, let me get this in real quick, and we'll take more comments or questions. Number three, still others suggest the reason that they didn't use instruments in the early church was financial. My first thought when I thought about that just statement, it's kind of kind of left at that, was financial. We can't afford it. Well, if you remember the first week we talked about this, that was one of the slides I had. The reason we don't have it is not because we can't afford it, but even that being said, and we kind of go back to the first century and, and you know, the economy was different, commerce was different, I, I understand, in the first century, but um, I, I think it's pretty beautiful and wonderful that God designed worship in such a way that you don't have to have a dime, right? You don't have to have a cent to do any of that. Is it a little more difficult maybe if we don't have song books and somebody has to copy the songs or we all have to kind of memorize them or whatever? Might it be a little more uncomfortable or difficult? Yes. Uh, but as far as other things go, then, you know, you don't have to have, we don't have to have this. Trust me, we sat last week and sweated our rear ends off, as we said, you know, all week in the heat. You don't got to have this nice air conditioning. Now, I'm thankful for it, but, uh, but we don't have to have that. We don't have to have this building. God's designed it in such a way that as if we, if we can be gathered together, as we should be gathered together, then we can without any kind of worry about finances. Uh, and so when we talk about church history, I just think it's interesting um, that you know, we don't. And again, even going back to what Charles mentioned last week and the book says, which is the idea that um, you know, not just church history like first century church history, but also, um, you know, coming forward into as denominations began to expand. Still, a lot of the leaders, founders of so-called denominations were saying, you know, you won't find it anywhere around me or the worship that I'm a part of. And, and that's certainly true as we kind of take a look at this as well. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we're always looking for what's new. That's just kind of the way the world works, right? I mean, Faith and I were kind of joking about this a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night uh, as we had our last leaders meeting. We hadn't met here before, and we were talking about, just joking about cell phones, you know, and how far cell phones have come. And I said, you know, uh, if you remember, of course, many years ago, uh, there was the cartoon The Jetsons, right? The animated cartoon The Jetsons. And so we don't have flying cars yet, but how many of you, and certainly your parents and even grandparents, would have ever imagined that we could speak to someone, you know, so quickly, much less pay our bills that way. And I think uh, Faith even brought up just even the idea of indoor plumbing, you know, how far indoor plumbing has come in, you know, several hundred years or whatever. I mean, maybe you remember maybe a time visiting uh, somebody in your family and they'd have indoor plumbing yet. Like, I mean, technology is always changing and we like what's new. I mean, it's pretty neat. Things kind of are improved in a lot of ways and it's good. But we always seem to be looking for that. And I was listening to a lesson today. I always want to make a plug when I can for the resources that we have. Uh, Sunday night or Sunday afternoon, I mentioned a podcast that, that I listen to, Charles and I listen to sometimes. Um, but our elders graciously pay for us to be a part and to enjoy the Polishing the Pulpit uh, website, the 365. And we've been through that a few years ago. It's been hard to believe. It's been a while now, probably the end of 2019, before COVID even started, that uh, Brian, you know, talked to the elders about that and they agreed to help us. So just mention it again, um, it's access to, you know, thousands of videos of sermons, both ladies' classes, you know, regular kind of sermons, and even through COVID, a lot of preachers were recording things and, and putting videos out there. Uh, I still, I'll go a lot and search for something you know, search for music, search for, you know, the Lord's Supper, whatever it might be. You can find all kinds of things. So today I was, I was here today a little early and was listening to a lesson by John D. Berry, uh, who served as a, a sender here in Tennessee for many years out in Memphis. I uh, did a lesson about change and it really struck me. It was interesting. I think it was like 2015, which uh, he's a favorite of, of Charles and mine as well. His style of preaching is really good, but it was about 2015 
because he mentioned the word millennials and was kind of uh, giving some millennials a hard time. And I was laughing about it. And I was showing Hannah the clip and it was, it was, I mean, it was even, you know, seven years ago now that he was kind of talking about that idea of millennials, sometimes just not, you know, getting it, not always being with it uh, and that kind of thing. But, you know, he's using that as an idea to mention that we're often under pressure to change. And that's really what this breaks down to sometimes when it comes to what we do in our worship. It's that whether we take, kind of take that general term of millennials or whatever, young people, and we say we've got to stay up to date. The church has got to change or the church will die. And that's kind of what this, the thrust is behind this missionally profitable statement. That if we don't change what we're doing, we're going to be left behind. And in their statements that were made, there was kind of the idea of, um, you know, being able to draw in future generations. Uh, was one thing being able to draw in other people and if we can eliminate then just this one type of worship or add I guess not eliminate excuse me I know Charles said last week that the concept here is both and not eliminate but you can have both and if we can have both and then we can bring more people in it's profitable for us from a mission perspective but you know men are always looking and changing but there are some things that God simply doesn't want changed. You know, in 2 Peter 1.3 is the passage that we often point out. 2 Peter 1.3 that Peter says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's included right there in his word. Jude would say it then later in Jude verse 3 that the faith was once delivered to all the saints. We have what we need. I know that we like to change. And again, I'm thankful for technology and the way that it's improved our lives. But when it comes to what God has said, God has told us what to do. He's given us all things that we know. And here's the thing. It's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. And God didn't ask our opinion. That was one way that Brother DeBerry said it, and I appreciate it. I wrote it down. It's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. And God didn't ask our opinion on the matter. And here's what happens a lot of times at these congregations is they start rethinking and, and sort of restudying something. In fact, in this paper and things, it's mentioned that this has been going on for 10 years, that these conversations have been had and, and the elders have been studying these kinds of things. Uh, but we're under pressure to, to kind of change and update. And, you know, God tells us, you remember in Romans chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. You know, it's interesting, God doesn't want us to change into the world. He wants us to change the world. That's the point of what Paul is saying there. But we get caught up, well, if we will change and be like the world, then we can reach the world or draw the world in. But that's a, a dangerous, you know, again, a slippery slope, as we say, uh, area to kind of be on, thinking about, well, if we just change this or change that, and here's what happens. Uh, you know, we, people start jumping to other areas, and some people say, well, that will never happen. You know, somebody says, well, if, if we allow instruments, then we can allow, why can't we allow something else that seems outlandish, you know, whatever it might be, we can fill in the blank with anything. Somebody say, oh, that'll never happen. But I encourage you just to think about our, our country again and think about how far we have fallen away from God's word. And there were people at one point that said, oh, if we start there, well, that'll never happen. You know, oh, if we start this, well, then that'll, that'll never happen. And that'll never happen. And yet we kind of go further and further away. It may not happen immediately. It may not even happen in your lifetime. But once we kind of open up the door to, well, you know, it's whatever we want. And I think that was the statement I was trying to, I'd watch what Charles had said. I was trying to write down some of the things, uh, you know, I think Charles made the statement, it's a roadblock. You know, that's what they say. This is, the acapella only worship is a roadblock. So we'll just eliminate it and do away with it. Or again, kind of have this both and idea. But you know, the point is we don't get to decide what we eliminate. <laughs> we don't get to choose what to eliminate. We can't say, well, this is helpful and this is not helpful. Because here's what I've, I kind of thought about that, you know, this idea that it's a roadblock. Well, you know what else is a roadblock? Just living right, right? Just living faithfully. You know what else is a roadblock? Denying yourself and serving others. You know what else is a roadblock? Having to attend services and be a part of the church. So what if we just start baptizing people and we'll, you know, say, well, you only got to come once a month. As long as you're here once a month, that's okay. Because we don't want it to be a roadblock to you being a Christian. So we'll just eliminate, 
you know, you coming to having to come to services or feeling like you need to come to services and that'll be, be all right. Or, I, I mean, I, again, I don't want to be condescending or come too far, but why would we not just eliminate other things? If a person says, well, I want to become a Christian, we say, well, you can become a Christian, but, you know, you really don't have to stop doing any sinful things that you're doing. You know, that, that'll be okay. You just keep living the way you're living. We'll baptize you. You know, we'll get you wet, and then you just, you don't make any changes, and that'll be okay. Because, you know, we're just about baptizing people. If we just baptize enough people, we'll be okay. Uh, and, I mean, why, who gets to choose what to eliminate? Or who gets to choose what roadblocks there are? Because really the problem is it's not always just instrumental music and worship. There are some people who love instruments or love music. I mean, I keep giving the example of our family, but it's very obvious. If you know us, we love music. You know, the kids are learning instruments and playing. We love music. That's not the problem. But when we start talking about, well, what are we going to change? Well, what can we do to draw more people in? Then, you know, who says we get to decide what that might be? And yeah, we start changing that one thing, then why can't it be something else? And if it's just about numbers, and this really bleeds back into our uh, Church Reset book that we covered recently, but it seems far-fetched, but you know, who are we to get to decide what gets eliminated? Because, man, all kinds of people could get wet or become Christians if they really didn't have to do anything. I mean, if we could just eliminate certain things. The biggest roadblock is not usually instruments. The biggest roadblock is repentance. And just having to change, having to live faithfully, having to submit to God's will, submit to Christ. That's the biggest roadblock because people don't want to change what they want to do. But why can't we eliminate that? I know people who fall on the other side of this argument here would say, well, that's, that's you know, we're not saying that at all. Okay, maybe you're not, but somebody else coming along after you may. Charles? Yeah. Uh, Charles mentions the kind of, what you say, community church. Yeah, community church idea are seem to be popular, you know, booming, that kind of idea. And it is. It's a lot of just, well, we'll just be a melting pot of all these different things. It doesn't really matter what the Bible says, or we might not even really preach, quite preach the Bible, but... You know, just as long as we can get more people in and just be accepting. Which, by the way, that's the world's, that's the world's mindset, right? With homosexuality and all these things. Just be open. Be accepting of everything. And, you know, I kind of make the argument that God is uh, love and God loves everyone. And, and, you know, God wouldn't be mean. That's true. Uh, but God also, you know, we see through Scripture, learn one of the aspects of God is He does expect people to follow His word. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Repentance is the hardest step because people don't really want to change. They'll believe, and again, they're, they don't mind to get wet, as we say. I mean, I keep, don't mean to keep saying that and minimize, but just that's what they, they don't care to do those things, but repentance is sometimes the hardest, hardest one. Lance? Yeah, don't want somebody to tell them no. It comes from authority figure, you know, mom and dad, and when you go to the roots of police, stuff like that. And uh, uh, they have to get rid of, they have to get away from God's authority to be able to do these things, you know. And they don't like to hear, no, and, and, and they get offended, and we're really, like, we're bad people to say this is wrong. Anyway, you know, God's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have, you have to submit. Yeah. Submissive submissive. Submission. That's what we kinda have to be after. Did you listen to that one yet, Charles, this week? I, I told you Sunday night, the Think Deeper podcast, the one on Monday was on bad so called bad Christian words, and the word for this week was submit. And that's what people don't like. They don't like to submit. That's what Lance is, is getting. I hadn't listened to it either, but yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. We're often after the path of least resistance. So we all are to some extent. I mean, you know, we got hard workers here, and I look around at all y'all. I mean, you know, not calling anybody lazy. We we've got hard workers and things, but at different times in our life, we're after the 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 path of least resistance. You know, whatever's easiest, that's what I'll do. And and yeah, that's right. Um, what Robert says, you know. This idea of, of including the sinner's prayer, that then there's really not even commitment or certainly not other steps, then that's easy. A lot of people will take that easy path. I think that's kind of part of this as well with submission. So, Mitch. You're going to feel the broad way fast. That's a great point. And so I, want to do, I do want to get to one passage in just a minute um, that kind of goes along with this. But Charles said it last week that the point of the purpose of worship is not to evangelize. And that's what this part of this statement is kind of getting at, that it's missionally profitable. Um, we hope that when people walk in the doors, especially if they've never been here before, that it is an encouraging kind of worship and worship type atmosphere. But that is not the purpose of that. It's not to evangelize. Uh, it's to praise God. And we talked about that a few weeks ago on Sunday morning, the lesson on better worship. That's what we talked about. It's to praise God. And so this idea that, you know, I mean, again, people are going to notice it. Uh, they're going to kind of be a part of it. But that's not what it's the, the point of the purpose of it is. And so we kind of have to be, be careful of that. Uh, one other thing real quickly that's mentioned in this is the idea that, that going to this both-and thought process or format uh, engages the gifts of the church. And so that's kind of a whole discussion, too, that we don't really have time to, to really get deep into. Um, but, you know, we're all thankful that we have different gifts and abilities, but certainly we all have different gifts and abilities. Not all of our gifts or abilities, uh, in that sense, are pointed towards, again, worship. Um, we can all do lots of different things that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> we got people who can do a lot of really pointless, you know, things that are just, you know, I, I can juggle for 10 minutes. Okay, that's great. We're thankful you can juggle for 10 minutes straight without dropping, dropping something. That's a talent. You know, you might even say that's a gift, uh, but that really has nothing to do with, with worshiping God. And so, again, I don't want to I don't want to veer over into being condescending. Um, but, you know, that that's kind of the thought is we all have things we can do. We just need to be very careful that, you know, I mean, it's not all it needs to be involved with our worship towards uh, God because that's not, you know, that's not, God has told us what to do. That gets back in the authority. He's told us the way he wants to be worshiped, the acceptable kind of worship. And not only that, but he's also made the statement, as Jesus said, that anything that involves the commandments of men is what we classify as vain worship. And we can be engaged in vain worship. You can show up to a church building and sit in a pew and offer vain worship to God because you're caught up in what you want or what you think or pleasing yourself or again, even evangelizing in a sense and you get caught up in that as opposed to praising God and um, you know, we can get caught up in, in vain worship. Uh, real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So here, kind of with this idea of... Uh, missionally profitable. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22, Paul makes a statement that you are familiar with, no doubt, and people like to kind of throw out sometimes that I have become all things to all men or all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So if this statement is taken all by itself, then it seems to imply that Paul is saying that he's willing to do anything to reach the lost. It would also seem to justify Christians living worldly lifestyles as long as their goal is to save someone. So should we become all things to all men? Because again, that's kind of what this uh, missionally profitable statement is saying, that if it's okay to... You know, if Paul's willing to do anything, then we should be willing to do anything. This is, kind of, this is an article I found by a brother out in Texas, but uh, he asked a few questions. And again, 
we start veering over into what people would say is the outlandish, but he says, would a Christian be justified in doing drugs to reach people on drugs? Would a Christian be justified in using profanity and crass slang, so to speak, to speak to today's youth? Would a Christian be justified in dressing provocatively because that's how people in our culture dress? Or how about this one? And he, let's see, I don't, 2013 was when this was written. He said, how about this one? I recently heard someone pose the question, would a Christian be justified in becoming a nudist to reach out to people in a nudist colony? Now, I'm going to tell you, I've not heard that one yet besides reading this article. But if 1 Corinthians 9.22 means that Christians can do anything if the goal is to reach the lost, then the answer to those questions would have to be yes. It's okay to do anything in order to reach someone. And I mean, people will even go further. They'll put the passion behind it just to save one soul. If I could reach one person, would that be right? The answer would be yes, uh, if, if that's true, that a Christian can do anything. And the Christian would actually also find himself violating a multitude of other New Testament passages, of course, that talk about some of those questions that were just asked. So he says, obviously, this passage cannot mean there are no limits to what a Christian can do. It does not it cannot mean that. And as we said Sunday afternoon in our lesson, what we must do then is take the context, that magic word context, and think about what Paul is saying very quickly. Uh, number one, in this context, Paul is talking about Jews and Gentiles. Notice in verse 20, if you turned over. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. For instance, even though Paul knew he was no longer restricted in his diet by the Old Testament law, he was willing to live under those dietary restrictions to keep from offending those who, again, were still trying to think that the Old Testament was binding. When Paul was with the Gentiles, he was no longer bound the law's restrictions on himself because he realized he wasn't under the Old Testament law. As he said there, again, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. So, you know, it would be counterproductive in one sense for Paul to live as a Jew while he was with the Gentiles because then he would risk, uh, like the Judaizers who tried to bind the law on these Gentile Christians. And uh, he says here, again, this article says, the best application I can think of is a Christian missionary going to a place which has self-imposed cultural regulations. For instance, if a Christian woman were to travel to the Middle East, it might, it might be wise for her to wear something in keeping with the local customs. She knows God is not bound on her, that attire, but if she hopes to not offend those people, she should tempor temporarily bind those laws on herself. But when she comes back to her own country, there's no reason to keep wearing that attire. So context is Jew and Gentile. Number two, Paul, and this is kind of key, Paul was speaking restrictively, not permissively. We've talked about silence a lot here recently, but here Paul is speaking restrictively, not permissively. He was saying that he was willing to deny himself to give up his rights in order to reach people with the gospel. In fact, that's what this whole chapter is about. If you're still there in verse 12, he talks about his right to financial compensation, that he has a right to be paid for what he's doing in the preaching. But he says, we have not made use of this, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Verse 15, but I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any kind of payment or provision. And so he's saying he is a servant. Verse 19, I have made myself a servant to all. So in context, everything that Paul is saying has to do with him restricting himself, not just doing whatever he wants to do. Many people use this passage to justify their behavior in a permissive way, as if to say, I, I'm permitted to do anything that I want in order to reach the loss. But it seems like in context, this is the exact opposite of what Paul was actually saying. He was saying, I give up what I want and what I'm entitled to in order to reach the lost. So that's kind of an interesting point there. And then number three in this article, he says, Paul beat his body. In verse 27, he ends the chapter by saying, 
Chapter 9, verse 27, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul was willing to serve anyone. He was willing to give up his rights for the sake of the gospel, but he was not willing to give up his salvation. There was no amount of pain that Paul was willing, was not willing to endure for the sake of the gospel. But to hint or even to suggest that Paul was willing to flirt with sin, doing drugs, living in a nudist colony, again, whatever you might want to say, to say that Paul was willing to flirt with sin in order to reach the sinful seems to be a total misrepresentation of this passage and what Paul is saying here. I like the way he uh, concludes part of this article here. He says, if you go to reach the Amish, maybe give up your right to wear colorful clothes. And I think I'm going to insert my own here, especially with my change in attire tonight. But if you're willing to reach people in Alabama, you might even give up your Tennessee hat long enough to try to reach people in Alabama. Be willing to sacrifice any and every right you have that others may go to heaven. Um, again, I'm being a little facetious there, but that's certainly the idea of um, restrictive rather than permissive. Uh, I know we're, we're quickly out of time. I want to share one final thing. I let Charles borrow this last week. It's not actually mine. I was borrowing it. But it's called Music and Worship, uh, a new examination of an old issue. And it's what I've turned to a lot uh, because it kind of addresses a lot of the things we've been talking about directly. But the last appendix, there's three in the back of this book, is entitled Eternal Music and, excuse me, Instrumental Music and Eternal Judgment. And it's the idea of this topic becoming a heated debate and argument among people. Uh, he says, um, let's see, what part was I going to read here? He talks about the idea that other people should be grateful that they will not have to stand before me in the final judgment. Uh, in the in spirit of insights gained from a former teacher, if I were the judge, some people would be allowed into heaven who should not be there, and others would be excluded who should be welcomed in. But God will not make such mistake. He said, analogies are not always perfect, but there may be something helpful with this one. Which of the following approaches from your child would you prefer? Which of the following approaches from your child would you prefer? Dad, if I did this, will you disinherit me as your son? Or in respect to this, Dad, if I did this, or in respect to this in particular, Dad, would you want me to do? What would you have me to do? Two separate questions, but sort of leading down those two different paths. Dad, if I do this particular act, will you disinherit me? Or in respect to this particular act, Dad, what do you want me to do? Upon reflection, I think any parent would prefer the latter. And I suspect that the heavenly... Heavenly parent prefers that we approach him in search of what he wants us to do rather than trying to find the acts for which he will not condemn us. Christians uh, who believe that we should approach God in song without instruments do not do so because we fear that God will send us to hell if we play instruments in church. Instead, we approach God without instruments because we are convinced that in his word he has taught us that such is what he desires. And there's several other references here and things, but uh, it's a question of what the New Testament authors us to do in worship, not about who will be condemned or damned or anything like that. So, um, you know, a serious discussion. I appreciate the good comments and thoughts in that regard. Um, I'll try to get to you by Sunday or so, certainly by next week, the next uh, one we're going to move on and, again, just conclude one more time. If you have any further discussion or questions about this stuff, then, then see one of us. And we'd love to, to try to have that uh, honest discussion with you. So appreciate the good attention through all this. And uh, we'll pick up there then next week.
Good evening. Welcome to everyone here to our midweek Bible study. We are glad that you are here. If you're visiting with us, we're extremely glad that you stopped here and visited with us tonight. I'd like to have you back each and every opportunity. Uh, if you would, mark your hymn books. Our invitation sign will be 207 207. Hark the gentle voice. Brother Joel will give us an invitation here in just a second. Our first, first song will be 798. 798. Gary Grove will lead us our opening prior to sing this song. We'll do all three verses and then we'll do the chorus. 798. We'll do all three verses. And on the third verse, we'll do the chorus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this opportunity that you've given each of us to come out this evening for a midweek Bible study to refresh our knowledge and to be with Christian like minds. Father, we're thankful that uh, we are children of yours and we're thankful that we can wear the Christian name proudly. Father, we're also thankful for the congregation here that meets at this Saudi location, and Father, we ask your continued blessings on, on each and every one. Father, we have many people on our sick list, and we continue to lift them up to you, and Father, we are, we are happy that uh, some prayers have been answered and some of our members have been able to come back, but Father, we need you to continue to be with our sister Joyce Proctor and Brother Carl Harrison and Sister Gail Griffith and Sister Billy Harris and Brother Shelley Everett, Sister Betty Barner, Sister Bre Brenda Shipley, and Sister Vicki Smith. Father, everyone, every one of these people continue to need your help in their healing and in their situations that they've got going on, Father. And we also are mindful of people on our prayer list. And Father, we. Uh, want to mention uh, Brother Bill and Sister Sylvia Greer, and we would hope that everyone continues to keep them in their prayers and, and keep them lifted up to you. Father, we're thankful for Brother Joel and his ability that uh, he comes and teaches and preaches from your divine word in a, 
way and manner that we can apply it to our everyday lives. And Father, this series that we've been in for the last few weeks, uh, going, going through the instrumental music, Father, we, we pray that everyone gets a good grasp of this and that everyone who has questions will ask those questions and that we will finish this study up with a, a good knowledge and a good, good feeling in regard to this. Father, we're thankful for our eldership. We have good, strong elders that continue to lead this congregation in the Christian way. And Father, we're thankful for the deacons that we have and, and the ability and the eagerness that they have to do and to get their work done. Father, we're most thankful for the spiritual blessings that we receive through your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for everything that he went through that our sins can be forgiven now. And we're thankful that, that we have a promise of a home in heaven. Father, at this time, we would like to confess our sins to you. Father, sometimes uh, we sin through ignorance. We just don't know what we should be doing and what we should not. Father, other times uh, we just have a weak moment and the, the uh, devil gets the best of us. Father, whatever our reasons may be, Father, we ask tonight that you forgive us of all of those sins. Father, it is our goal to live a good Christian, faithful life and to reach that heavenly goal. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we've stated recently in a couple of sermons about our worship, uh, we need to pay attention to the songs that we sing, the words that we sing, uh, that we realize what we're doing and what we're saying, that sometimes when we sing, we sing to God, we praise Him. Other times we sort of sing to each other, to one another. The song that we just sang is one of those, the idea of yielding not to temptation. Again, I don't know how often that you pay attention to the words. Uh, of course, our Projectors being down, having to use the book sometimes helps us a little bit maybe, takes us out of our usual flow and what we kind of are used to doing that. But sometimes we also, you know, skip verses for time and various things. We may skip over the middle verse or some of the middle verses. The second verse of the song, Yield Not to Temptation, is uh, an interesting one because it begins to list some of the things that we might fall to. We said, sang just a few moments ago, shun evil companions, bad language disdain, that we need to hold God's name in reference, but not take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest and kind-hearted and true. You know, when we stop in the middle of the week and extend the Lord's invitation, we're about to sing a song in just a moment with the idea, of course, of come. That's what the invitation is. Jesus saying, come unto me. If you've got heavy burdens, which we all do, maybe heavier sometimes than others, but if we have heavy burdens, we can come to him. He will bear those. We can take his yoke, which is easy and light. We can have peace and hope in him. But it's the temptation that weighs us down. That's a list of things that we just sang together. Maybe one of those is something that you've been struggling with. But of course, as we know, it doesn't have to be that. It could be anything in your life that you're having trouble with right now. Maybe it's sin of a public nature that you need to come forward and make that known. Maybe it's not public in a sense, but you'd like to come forward and let your brothers and sisters pray for you and with you. Maybe it's just the discouragement, the temptation of this world that gets us down. We are thankful for this opportunity that presents itself and even the opportunity, as we just did, to encourage ourselves to think about some of the things that sometimes get in the way of being a faithful Christian. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, we'd be singing to encourage you that you would put Christ on in baptism. That is where salvation is found. We love you. We can pray for you. We can sort of lift you up and encourage you, but we can't take away your sin. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, it is only in Christ that you can find salvation, that you can have your sins washed away by his blood. And we'd be singing first and foremost to encourage anyone who may be in that position even tonight. Maybe you're here and you've done that. You know what it means and that feeling that you feel when you have your sins washed away. But we know that we are often thankful for more time on this earth to spend with our family, to, to meet new people, to encourage one another as we go through this life. But even while we're enjoying those blessings, Temptation tends to get us down. If you're here tonight and you are a child of God, but you're struggling with something and you'd like to make that known, you would like to come, again, unto Christ first and foremost, but secondly, before your family and share something in a way that we can pray with you and for you, we would love to do that. We're just thankful for the chance to encourage one another, even now as we stand together and as we sing.
Just a few announcements to share with you this evening. Uh, as far as our sick list goes, uh, we mentioned on Sunday morning, I asked you to add to the prayer list Nana Templeton, who'd been dealing with an allergic reaction. I don't know if it's Monday or Tuesday, I messaged uh, Dawn and asked her, and she said that she was some better, had received some medication, but was still in some pain and having some itching issues from that allergic reaction. So continue to pray for our sister Nina. Uh, we also ask you to add uh, Brother C.J. Davis to your prayers from the Dunlap congregation who had injured his Achilles last week while we were out at camp, and he is scheduled for surgery on Tuesday of next week. Uh, so we ask that you continue to pray for them. Uh, Travis asked me if we would add to our prayer list a, one of his coworkers. It's his coworker's wife, Renee Card, who has received a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And we'll have some further things uh, coming up to kind of determine more details about that. But uh, they ask that we pray for uh, Renee Card, and he said, of course, that is a relative of Billy's as well. Uh, and so we want to add her to our prayer list. Uh, many of you have seen tonight, uh, he's about tired of asking and answering all the questions, but uh, Campbell has a new um, accessory to his outfit. Uh, he injured his toe yesterday, kind of uh, playing around the house. And we, Hannah took him to the doctor today, and they said it does look like it's broken, and they put him in a boot. I just joked he wanted to join the boot club around here. There's been about four or five of, of our people over the last few years that have had to wear a boot for a while, so, but he's got a little boot on his left foot. Uh, that he'll wear for three to four weeks, and then they'll go back and see if anything further is needed. So uh, we appreciate your prayers on, on his behalf. Was well, there anyone else as far as our sick list we need to update? Uh, we did make mention on Sunday morning of Tallulah Wilson being baptized last week where, while we were out at camp. And then on Sunday, we were thankful uh, Jacob made the decision on Sunday morning, and so we're thankful uh, for that as well. I want to make sure and announce those. As far as our other announcements, on Sunday, got, got several things here, so bear with me for just a moment. On Sunday, we're still on for the elders, deacons, and preacher meeting Sunday afternoon after our afternoon service. Uh, also, on Sunday morning, if you are a part of Adult Class 1, uh, Brian will be out of town Sunday, be traveling back Sunday, hopefully be back with us for our afternoon service, but he won't be here, and our teachers have been maneuvered around with the start of a new quarter in teaching. And so if you're in adult classroom number one, please plan to come in here in the auditorium on Sunday morning uh, for class. Uh, our youth, there are several things going on with the youth in the next few weeks. Um, most of the parents have got the announcement, so I won't go into great detail. Uh, if you've got questions though, next Friday night into Saturday morning uh, is a lock-in at the Dunlap congregation. Gabe was kind of heading that up. So if you've got questions, see him. The next weekend, I guess they're trying to cram all this in before school starts back. The next weekend, there's a lock-in involved with the East Ridge congregation, uh, and Travis has kind of been heading up some of that. If you have any questions, you can see him about that. That's the 5th and the 6th, so a few weeks away. On Saturday, August the 6th, is the Greens Lake Road Youth Lectures. It's kind of a camp reunion, even though we've not been that far from it, but a camp reunion for those of us who go to McCroy Bible Camp. Uh, but August the 6th at the Greens Lake Road congregation, anyone is welcome to come, have breakfast and three lessons with singing, and then lunch on Saturday, August the 6th. And so, I think so. If I got a voice by then, I'll be leading singing. I usually get asked to do that. Appreciate that good opportunity. Uh, so that's our youth. And if you see Gabe or Travis or even myself, we would be willing to take the bus on that 6th if anybody wants to go, if we have enough that can. Um, BBS. Number one, there is a list on the table in the lobby for those who would stay for that Sunday afternoon for lunch. Last year when we did this, we just did pizza and salad, kind of a quick lunch, maybe a little bit easier cleanup, and then everybody can get to work on what they need to finish and get ready. So if you would stay for that, stay for lunch, and then help us get ready, sign that so we have an idea of how many to plan for for lunch. Uh, if you are going to be around the building for the next couple of weeks, we won't start just yet necessarily because of classes on Sunday morning and next Wednesday night, but just be aware we'll be getting things ready, we'll be using classrooms. Uh, in particular, uh, kind of a word of warning to our kiddos and to parents to help watch out for kiddos as we start getting things decorated uh, over the next couple of weeks to keep an eye on the building as you're uh, moving around. And then if you have not signed up to help, we could maybe use a little bit more. If you have, Please see Hannah tonight, if, uh, especially if you've kind of signed up to lead something, one of the uh, lessons or snacks or crafts. If you sign up to lead something like that, see her tonight. We have information to put in your hand, uh, hand so that you'll know a time frame and what's going on. So we're really excited about uh, VBS in a couple of weeks or a week and a half, 
And uh, we'll be posting on Facebook about it soon with a kind of a little uh, graphic with the date and time. You could share that. Maybe try to get a few flyers printed that you can hand out to people in the community or friends and family. But uh, we'd love to have a good crowd. That Sunday, the 31st, from 1.30, our regular starting time, to 4.30. And just to make mention again one more time, uh, we won't have a traditional service at 1.30. We'll have an adult class. And if you're here and come for the afternoon session, we can certainly um, extend uh, the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper again, but we won't have sort of our hour-long traditional afternoon service. Any other comments or questions uh, going on? Heath? Yes. Uh, if you've not visited the youth bulletin board, which is the first one, if you go out this door and hang your right head towards the bathrooms, uh, Heath has got several things up on there. A small schedule, kind of for the fall, sign up list for like Rush for the kids, and then a sign up sheet in particular if you would be willing to host a youth devotional uh, one day a month, just one month, and pretty much from August on, it's open. And so we usually make the announcement. We really just like for you to have a place. If you could help with the food, that's great. Uh, if you'd like us to help with the food or the kids to bring desserts and drinks and maybe you provide part of the meal, that's fine. But we'd love for our kids to be in your home or something like that where they can get to know you and they have a place to go. And so if you have any questions, see Heath about that. So anything else? If not, then we hope to see you on Sunday morning and after our closing song, uh, Keith Ritchie, or yeah, not Keith Ritchie, that's from camp last week, Ricky Ritchie. Too many Ritchies around here, that's the problem. Ricky Ritchie has the closing prayer. Let's be standing, please. 230. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you once again for this opportunity to come with, be here with you, be to worship you. Father, we look forward to the time where we can worship you again. Uh, please be with us as we go to our homes and keep us safe. Please forgive us from our sins. In Christ's name, amen.